Hello, everybody. My name is Jim Dulambakis. I'm the uh, owner of Open Sky Events and Rooftop Cigars. Uh, thanks for joining us. We're here to uh, start our cigar and cigar and spirit series. We're going to be doing it on a weekly basis. Uh, we're going to be interviewing cigar aficionados, uh, spirit ambassadors, cigar shop owners, um, and we're going to be discussing their company, their brands, and learning about what they do and who they are. Uh, today we have Mike Danulis from Soho Cigar Bar. Uh, we also have David Powell from Hudson Whiskey and William Brandt. Uh, first, I'm going to bring on Michael Danulis. Michael, you there? Yo. How hey, are you? What's up, buddy? How are you? How's it going? Oh, living the dream during this uh, Corona pandemic here. I know. I know. The zombie apocalypse to take over. How you been? Uh, so I love the hat. I got Thank one too. Um, let's talk about. So you're the general manager of Soho Cigar Bar in New York City. Yes, sir. Um, tell us. Uh, tell us about yourself. Who you are. Um, tell us about Soho. Love to hear more about that. Um, wh before we begin, what are you smoking right now? <laughs> I'm doing the uh, Soho blend, the Matador. It's, nice. uh, it's one of uh, nine of our house blends that we sell at the bar, and uh, it's privately made in New York City. Uh, it's one of the only cigars cultivated in New York City that's uh, sold in New York City as well. So we like to uh, keep that going at the bar. And uh, I was kind of jonesing for one, so I figured, why not? What are you smoking tonight, buddy? So last time I was at your uh, cigar bar was for uh, uh, E.P. Carrillo's uh, fundraiser event. So I actually had this cigar stored away, and I, and I pulled it out for the special occasion, especially since we haven't been able to What's going on? <laughs> hey everybody thanks for tuning in jimmy you froze up a little bit i can't hear you anthony you're the man steve my boy deruso what's going on hmm Jimmy, you froze up on me, buddy. You there? As Jimmy uh, seems to be out of commission, everyone text me on this little thing here. I love this. <laughs> Ow, shut up. <laughs> Go back, give me some funny comrades. These are facts. These are facts. Hope everyone's staying healthy. Hope everyone's staying safe with this uh, zombie virus that's going around. All good spots, Anthony. All good spots. What are you guys smoking today? Comment on the pictures below. Steve, what Monty are you smoking, bud?
There he is. All right. All right. A little technical difficulty there. No worries. Uh, we're back. Okay. So you were saying? Uh, I, you broke up a little bit. I didn't hear you. Why don't we start over? I said, uh, what's uh, so you're so, so uh, let's talk about Soho Cigar Bar. Uh, tell us a little bit about that. Uh, you, you're the general manager. How long have you been working there for? Uh, I've been there a little over two years. Uh, with the pandemic, uh, two years and eight weeks and four days and three hours. Uh, no, I'm just joking. I'm going a little crazy with this uh, antisocial stuff. I'm not really antisocial. <laughs> um, but yeah, a little over two years. And uh, Soho's been there uh, 22 years now. And it was always cigar, Soho Cigar Bar for 22 years? Well, it actually started out, uh, so it's been a single owner. Lee Ringelheim has had this place 22 years, single owner, started when he was 26. Um, it started out as a cigar, uh, cigarette bar, actually, and it was called Cafe Tabac. And what Lee wanted to do was just start an environment that was really laid back. He grew up in the, yeah, like the movies and uh, pursued a career in the movie industry and always kind of dug that, like, cool vibe of the movie scene, you know, like, you know, the bartender, you know, the people there, that cheers atmosphere. And he started it out that way. And uh, he's pretty unique. He always knew how to bring in a crowd. Um, he knew people at various uh, music and movie productions. So he always had some A-list people in there and they kind of really were into the vibe he was putting out and his style of management. And uh, he was just a guy who was going to do whatever it took to get it done. And I'm fortunate enough now, I've known him for a little over 10 years, maybe about 12 years, actually. And, uh, you know, being in the hospitality industry my whole life, I really clung to him. And I, I really was into his management style and his general outlook of the industry and how he ran his place. Um, about five years go by, you know, he was, uh, you know, living off 100 bucks a week, doing everything he could to make the place survive. And he finally started to catch some traction and uh, he renamed it Circa Tabac and then kind of just made it like a smoking lounge. Uh, once the smoking ban passed though, that's when he rebranded. And uh, I'm proud to say I was actually part of the think tank team to rename it Soho Cigar Bar. Cause uh, after the smoking ban, it's very clear there's only a couple spots in New York City that you can actually drink, eat and smoke. And uh, he wanted to just cultivate to that clientele, so uh, he renamed it Soho Cigar Bar, and it's kind of been taken off ever since then. He's been adding more drinks, more cigars to the menu. Um, we have over 150 whiskeys now. We have uh, over 100 cigars on the menu, and we're just uh, looking to keep going and keep growing from there. I think Jimmy stepped out again. Let's keep talking about cigars. Billy as a guest. You know Billy, huh, Anthony? How good is that Viva cigar? That is definitely one of my favorite cigars, and it's going to be on the menu at Soho Cigar Bar very shortly, as soon as we get past this uh, coronavirus. I want to take this minute while Jimmy stepped out to uh, tell everyone I hope you're being healthy and happy, and uh, I really hope everyone's safe and Wear your mask, protect yourselves, be smart. It's uh, We're not past it yet, but we will be. Best bourbon selection, Anthony. Thank you. <sighs> Anthony, we're going to get you a hat. Don't worry. You want, the, you want the snapback or you want the flex fit? Might just take over, call this the Soho Hour with Mike. Guys, also I wanna take this minute uh, on my Instagram page, Mike underscore the Greek. We have a GoFundMe page. It is going to help the staff at Soho Cigar Bar uh, through these hard times. Uh, I think we all know unemployment and uh, the, the checks that they're sending out are not getting there on time. and. Not everyone's getting approved for whatever reason, and uh, all the donations go towards the staff to help them through this with their bills and all the nonsense of living up here in New York and all the craziness, and we appreciate it. Uh, with your donations, we have packages available where you get hats and shirts and 
uh, cigar, cutters, lighters, all kinds of fun packages, gift cards. Take a look. It's on my page uh, at Mike underscore the Greek. And it's uh, right in my bio. Take a look. We appreciate it. Uh, with a $50 donation, you get a hat and it goes up from there. Um, what am I sipping on? I'm doing McCallum 12 now, guys. What are you guys drinking on? There he is. All right. Well, as much as I want it to be outside, it's not working out today. No worries. Me and the uh, guest here, we're talking I'm in, about cigars. I'm in, the house. I'm in the house. I apologize. I wanted this. Nice weather to be in the background, but it's not going to happen. Okay, so I'm sorry. Where did we leave off? Uh, so we were talking about uh, the creation of Soho and Lee's journey. Right. And, um, you know, we were talking about uh, the 22 years that he did. And uh, once he rebranded it as Soho Cigar Bar, he um, really took off from there as far as um, constantly – redecorating, uh, getting new menus in with more selection and not only adding to the menu, but educating staff. And that's another thing that, you know, one of the many things that we work well together, we're very much on being educated on all our products, whether it's a $15 scotch or a $300 scotch, we like to make sure that you're comfortable with what you're spending and create a non-intimidating vibe at the place. And, and I actually know Lee. He's a great guy. Um, I think. Yeah. How long you guys known each other now? I gotta say, I probably know Lee probably five years. Um, yeah. Very cool. And, and I and I stumbled upon Soho Cigar Bar. Uh, actually, I probably know him eight years. Eight years ago, I set out to do. I was in. I was producing rooftop cigar uh, rooftop tours, rooftop bar tours, and uh, I started in New York. I started producing them. I, I just thought around eight, nine years ago, there was a kind of a trend of rooftop, rooftops popping up everywhere. And, and they have, they popped up literally all over the world in the last decade. And um, and I said to myself, my friend, he, the first time I smoked a cigar <coughs> was about nine years ago. And he goes to me, you should try it. And I, I, I said, oh, I never smoked cigarettes before. He's like, try this cigar, it's, you can enjoy it. So I, I tried it. I, and we had whiskey and I was like, wow, this is, I was like, it was like a time warp. I was, I was like, wow, this is amazing. Um, and at the same time I said, okay, let's go smoke. And obviously in New York, you can't really smoke anywhere except Soho Cigar Bar and a couple of establishments, but you can't smoke on some of the rooftops. And I, I said, well, let's do an event. So we did one, we got some people together, then we did more and more and they just kept growing. And we went from 50 to 200 to 300. And then that's when I said, well, where else can we do events? Uh, so then we got boats. And that's when we rolled out boats and spokes. And, and that's how the whole idea and everything happened. Yeah, that's um, really so, cool. Yeah, Little so, back for the viewers here. Me and Jimmy hooked up, uh, let's, what do you think, about five, six years ago? Yeah. I was working at a club that had a rooftop, and I was the resident cigar guy. And everyone knew yeah. that. And my manager at the time, came up to me and pitched this idea of this Greek guy who's doing cigars on the roof. And I'm like, well, what time is he doing it? How's it work? And I was like, how do you know he's Greek? And then he said his last name. I was like, yeah, pretty Greek. That's yeah. pretty Greek. And uh, yeah. we ended up linking up a long time ago at one of my other establishments. And uh, we always had that working relationship. And then about, what, year and a half, two years ago, Lee came to me and was like, do you know Jimmy? I was like, oh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. And uh, we've been we've done like about five six parties together. Yeah, we've done we've done a bunch of events. You guys were one of our partners on the on the, uh, the rooftops and also boats and smoke cigar cruise, um, which is pretty cool. So uh, let's talk about you're you're an expert. You're uh, a sommelier. Uh, tell me about that side of you. And and actually, before we get into that, um, what is a cigar to you? And and what was your first cigar? What was your experience? I just told you about mine, but what was your first experience? So, um, 34 years old now, uh, my first cigar was 13. Uh, I was at my cousin's wedding and my dad, uh, has been a lifelong enjoyer of premium cigars. Uh, we were at this wedding and fun fact, I'm, uh, I'm half Italian, half Greek. So my dad is an amazing, amazing Greek dancer. He breaks the plates. He jumps in the air. He does all the crazy stuff. So, he got, he was smoking a cigar at the table. I was sitting next to him. And then all my family coaxed him into coming out and doing his crazy dance. So I'm sitting at the table and I'm looking at this cigar and I've heard my dad 
explain how to smoke a cigar a hundred times to friends and family and my cousins. And I'm, I'm the youngest of the, all the boys. So I just wanted to be around all the guys and hang out and be cool and act like I like coffee. So I kind of knew how to smoke a cigar before I smoked it, right? So I'm looking at this cigar and I'll never forget, it was a Cuban Romeo and Juliet. And I'm looking at it, I'm looking at it. And this was a time when I was horrified by my father. I didn't want to get in trouble whatsoever. He was a very scary man. I'm going to get my butt whooped if I touch this thing. So there was a lot of risk to this. And I was like, you know what, it's worth it. I picked this thing up. I remember him telling me, don't inhale it, blow it out, this, that. So I smoked most of the cigar and then I see him winding down. So I put the cigar back and I'm sitting there and he go, he comes back. Where, what happened to my cigar? I'm like, you smoked it. You're drunk. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, uh, I've actually, I don't think I've ever told him this story. So he might actually be tuned in now watching that. <laughs> the first time he's ever heard that story. So uh, thanks for the Romeo pups. No. Um, but you know, cigars mean a lot to me. Uh, they were very, very a part of my uh, youth and a part of me growing up. Um, you know, uh, I grew up in a kind of like a different era, uh, and my family was old school. So we were even more behind the times than, you know, we should have been in the nineties, but you know, with that comes family dinners every Sunday, Friday night, the families come over for barbecues and just hang out. And, you know, it was always a lot of, um, there was always a lot of camaraderie and, obviously arguing and screaming at each other at loud voices, but there was always a, a community of us and, you know, cigars and scotch and, you know, were kind of part of that. And it, it wasn't so much the cigars and scotch, it was what you did when you had them. And uh, it, it was just a really beautiful thing. And it was just something I was in love with before I even really knew what it was. And uh, my next cigar, I didn't have till I was 18. My dad actually gave me a cigar at my uh, high school graduation. We had a Cohiba Siglio 6, and uh, we just kind of cruised around. I'm from Atlantic City, New Jersey. So once we graduated, he took me and some of my friends. We lit up some Cubans and just kind of drove around Atlantic City and uh, just enjoyed the night. But, uh, yeah, it's always been a fun a fun thing to me. Yeah, so tell me about uh, – so cigars to me are uh, like a time warp, like a pause on time, right, uh, where – for the next hour or so, it's just I'm in the present moment. And and a lot of times, especially this day and age, we're so caught up in so many distractions, so much going on. And, and you know, sometimes this record, this cigar will stop that and we'll, we'll put a pause on time and say, hey, enjoy the cigar. Enjoy the moment. Have a nice cocktail if you want and just relax. Right. And I was watching. Um, Jerry Seinfeld with Larry David, uh, comedians and cars getting coffee. Great show. And and uh, and um, Larry David smoked cigars. You know, he's a big cigar smoker. Yeah, big and, time. And Jerry goes to him, Larry. You know, what, what's up with the cigars? You know, you smoke cigars and you, you know, you, you know, during, after lunch. But then people come in and they they ask you for advice, and you're like kind of like this oracle, like this all know it. And he goes, and he goes, what's the difference between cigars and cigarettes? And he goes, cigarettes is anxiety. He goes, cigars, you can't rush cigars. Okay. You know, you're committed. You can't rush a cigar. You know, you're it's not smoking. Impossible. It's impossible, right? You can't. It's you 45 can't. minutes where you smoke it first or not. <laughs> okay, so tell me about, um, let's talk about the cigars that you've studied and and what you've learned from them and and you know let's let's uh, tell the audience so let's get some information you know some knowledge about that that you know well i want to add to uh i'm a certified cigar sommelier tobacconist uh there's been a lot of confusion out there especially on social media about sommelier and comparing uh us to wine and blah 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 mm. here's what i am i am a certified tobacconist the level of my certification is sommelier so what I do is I study, not only have I studied the, the broad strokes of the tobacco industry, the cultivation, the growing, the making, advertising, all that good stuff. I've also studied alcohol and spirits and notes that spirits produce and notes that certain uh, tobacco produces. So if you were to ask me about a certain brand, what's in a certain cigar, unless I know it, I don't know it. But if I know what's in the cigar, I can you know, have a rough estimate of what uh, notes that's going to produce and, you know, what spirits I would pair with it. Um, and that's something I've done on my own. And, uh, it was something as I kind of did it for multiple reasons. One was, um, 
I wanted to get certified in tobacco uh, as something to, you know, make my boss feel good about hiring me, so to speak. Uh, Lee has been a lifelong friend and him hiring me was kind of like a funny story, but we'll get into that later. But I wanted to prove to him, like, I could do this. You know, I, I was running way bigger spaces, uh, you know, doorman, valet, rooftops, uh, you know, from my past. And I wanted to come in here, this being a smaller location, I wanted him to know that I was gonna dive into this 100% and that I was gonna take this to the next level. And once I found out about the um, Tobacco University and that I could actually get a certification in it, I just figured that would add credibility, not only to me, but to the bar. And uh, so far, so good it has. Uh, I'm not gonna lie, it definitely helps me sell more premium cigars because uh, it's an education. You know, what, what are you drinking? Uh, we're drinking uh, Hudson Rye. Oh, that's beautiful. That goes with this, this, that. I like it in this cocktail with that. It's just a general education. So, you know, you feel comfortable about your purchases and you feel comfortable about your time with us. So that way, let us worry about all the crazy. And then you can do what Larry David said and just sit there and relax. Right. So, so I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because education is, is it, so I find with my events, a lot of people come and smoke and and. Uh, they, they don't know. They're there with a friend and their friend pulls out, you know, a full body cigar. Right. It's their first cigar. And, and they go and they're like this. I can't. I'm sick. Right. So for me, I'm not going to lie. The first couple of years, I acted like I knew what, what I was doing. I did it. I didn't know anything about cigars. No, no. And, <laughs> and, 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 you know, the industry, you know, and people sometimes like it's a very couple like a lot of, uh, you know, great people and, and, and it's amazing, but sometimes you're kind of like, maybe I don't, maybe I don't know what I'm supposed to be smoking and should I ask, right? It might be a little intimidating. So let's talk about the different uh, bodies and, and, and how you, like, if I'm new and I just walked into your bar, like how would, how would you figure out what would be the right fit for me and what cocktail would match with that? I'm really happy you asked that because that's actually goes off of the education and the uh, certification. Um, how I do it is this. Uh, there's no such thing as uh, male, female. There's no anything. There's only, are you going to enjoy a cigar or you're not going to enjoy a cigar? That's the kind of way I look at it. So there's no like flavored cigars for female. There's no uh, big cigar, strong cigars for like a big, strong dude. No. What do you drink? What do you eat? So let's say you walk into the bar and you don't know what you want. I'd ask you what you're having tonight as a cocktail. And then I would ask, do you have that normally? Do you drink red wine or white wine? Do you eat steak? How do you have it cooked? Do you like steak or you like fish more? You know, try to get it. Let's, let's go through me, right? I'll act like I'm the customer. All right, let's do this. So yeah. what do you, I would say, what are you having tonight? You don't know yet. All right, so what do you normally drink? Let's say we were going out, we're going to bar hop, and you don't want to mix drinks, and you want to have I'm something a, you're comfortable with. I'm a Johnny Walker Black on the Rocks. Perfect. So a Johnny Walker Black on the Rocks, right? That's a blended scotch. It's going to have smoky notes. It has some bitter and sweet notes. So mm -hmm. being a blend, it's got an array of flavors, so it kind of matches up well with a lot of medium to full-bodied cigars. I wouldn't suggest something light, because it's going to be a little too creamy, and it's not going to mesh well. Like you wouldn't have red wine with a white fish, right? No. It just doesn't add up. So you, the same thing applies to cigars. If I'm having like a deeper red wine, maybe I go something a little more robust, something a little more, you know, peppery. Or if I'm having a white wine, maybe I have a Connecticut shade, something a little smoother, creamier on the palate, not overwhelming. And that's how I would do it. And I just kind of match it up based on your... Uh, based on what you drink normally what you're drinking that night you know okay and then so you're, so what about foods like like uh so you said medium to 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 uh and then what about foods like what can i eat what would you, would you suggest eating so that's the best part about it there's a lot of different cigars and at our place we have over a hundred different types so you know whatever you eat i can match up something and we have something for that whether it's a slice of pizza or a 300 dollars steak you know we, we have something that can go in that general direction and we're priced competitively to where you know there's something for everyone okay and what's a cigar that you would match up your cigars you i know you have a few brands which one would you specifically match up with me if i'm having a johnny walker so, uh, so I do enjoy Johnny Walker, and uh, one of the cigars I would do is uh, the Hefe. It's 100% Nicaraguan filler and binder. 
which is the inside of the cigar. And then the wrapper, which is on the outside, that's a Brazilian Maduro wrapper. So that Nicaraguan tobacco is going to be really earthy and strong. And then the, the Brazilian Maduro wrapper is still going to have that strength, but it's such a sweet, sweet tobacco that it kind of gets that strong, sweet flavor mesh. Mm -hmm. And it really, really is just one that like the tobaccos really marry well. And uh, I love that with a good blended scotch because it's uh, you know, I like that hodgepodge of flavors, like almost like a gumbo. Awesome. You know, and what about, that up. And what about uh, now you, you have your different brands and such. What do you smoke? What's your, what's your go-to? I know you have a humidor behind you. Uh, yeah. A few hundred cigars. What are we looking at there? Like, what's your, like, how do you organize your humidor? I mean, like, what do I you got, have? I got the humidor back here. I'm going to show you this crazy thing. Hold on. So this is the humidor. It's uh, six foot. Keep all my buddies in here. So with my humidor, I have a bunch of different selections. I like um, I like to have that option of you know strong delight. People assume I always smoke strong cigars. I smoke light cigars at midnight. I'll smoke strong cigars in the morning. I like to. Uh, it's just really about the mood for me. I'm a little bit more of an advanced uh, in this subject, so I like to like really get weird with it. You know, I even try to go out of the box and be like, all right, let me have a strong coffee with a light cigar. Let me see what it tastes like. Let me see how they marry with each other, how they pair. So I did an event and I, we did a survey and so a guy came back and said, uh, why don't you guys have coffee at the event? And it never dawned on me that people smoke coffee and drink cigars. Big time. Yeah. How, how does that work? Let's let's talk about that. Well, coffee has a lot of similar notes to tobacco. You're talking about the bitter. You're talking about pepper, cocoa. Um, I mean, espresso, coffee, uh, cappuccino, cream. These are all notes that are in tobacco already. So now you're sipping that, and it's just exploring on it. My suggestion to people is, you know, I like to go complete opposite with coffee. So if I'm having really, really strong coffee, I like to, you know, do a lighter cigar. Maybe a Connecticut shit. Like, it's like a reverse, right? I like, like that reverse. I like that, that weird flavoring, you know? Yeah. I've also been enjoying tobacco for over 15 years. So when I first started, it was, I kept it on par. I kept the, the strong tobacco with the strong coffee and then the lighter with the lighter. And now I just try to mix it up and just have fun with it. And, you know, it's trial and error. I've had, you know, cigars with some Greek coffee or Turkish coffee. And I'm like, this is gross. And then, you know, I've had ones that are really good. It just, you know, it's a matter of trial and error and having fun with it. Okay. Awesome. So we have a question here. I'm going to put it into the, uh, before we jump into that, is there anything else that you wanted to talk about on your side on, you know, how cigars are made or anything like that? And then we'll, what we'll do is after this, we're going to ask a couple of questions and then Jared Bailey's going to come on and show us a couple of cocktails uh, how to make a couple cocktails, simple, easy cocktails to make from home. Yeah, Jared's our uh, bar manager, and he's uh, as passionate about cigars as I am. And uh, his passion is doubled for you know cocktails and spirits. And I'm very lucky to be working with him. He's uh, taken me on a a really fun journey of like just kind of studying different spirits and how they're made, and knowing that just helps us more and more as uh, operators and as workers in the hospitality industry. Cause like I said, I just really want our customers and our clientele to feel comfortable with whatever they're doing. And um, it can be real intimidating when you got numbers in the bottle, uh, 12 year, 10 year, 15 year, like just once you know what it is, it's not intimidating anymore. And yeah. uh, you know, but to talk about something uh, always, people always ask me do's and don'ts in a cigar bar, yeah. right? And uh, well, number one is take care of the staff, right? That's always. These people are bringing you cigars and liquor. You want to take care of them. But the big do's and don'ts is this. Don't be intimidated. That's my biggest don't. Ask around, you know, like just come in and have fun. Don't let anything intimidate you. Like, you know, you have a drink you like. Maybe you have a cigar you like. Ask the staff. Talk to people. It's not none of these products, whether it's spirits or premium cigars, were made to be intimidating. Now, granted, some are more expensive, but... That's not that's not really a reflection of intimidation. They just they they age this 30 years for someone who can afford 30 years and they age this 12 years for someone who can afford 12 years. And it's OK either way, as long as you're enjoying 
Uh, Jose Blanco said there's uh, two best cigars in the world are a free one and the one you're smoking. And this guy has made some of the best cigars in the world, $200 cigars. And this guy's like, oh, the best cigar is a free one, right? So you, you just want to keep it on that vibe. And a big do for me is ask questions. You know, ask questions. Talk to the staff. And you know what? If they're not helpful, don't go back. That's what I tell people. If you're talking to people who are selling premium tobacco and fine spirits and they're not being helpful, don't go back. Because you can come to our spot, ask anyone. You can ask the bar back all the way to the bartenders, the servers. If they don't know, they'll get someone who knows. And most likely they know because they're passionate as well. And uh, if you're not in a place like that, it's not worth your time. and It's not worth the money, in my opinion. So those are two big do's and don'ts for me and something I wanted to talk about. Okay. And uh, what about like, so uh, what about pet peeves about cigar smoking? What's some pet peeves that you might have? All right. So some pet I peeves. I tell you one, but go ahead. You go first. So I also, uh, I wanted to add this in. Uh, I see this a lot being in Soho and being in New York and right by the financial district. Um, if you're at a meeting or you're with someone who is not a close friend and it doesn't matter, don't lick your cigar and then cut it and then hand the cutter to your friend or your person. I've been at the bar long enough where these two gentlemen or these two ladies or whoever is there is talking business and they're like, yeah, well, the stock portfolio, blah, blah, blah. And then they cut it and hand it. And you can see the other person cringe because to a cigar smoker, they don't think about it. But to someone who only does it a couple of times a year, so just something to think about as far as sanitation and keeping the coronavirus in uh, mind. And um, pet peeves. All right. So my biggest pet peeve is this. Hey, man, you're here. I'm happy you're here. Uh, what kind of cigars do you like? Cubans. We only smoke Cubans. <laughs> Cubans. I smoke Cubans. Oh, that's great. I love Cubans. What's your brand? Uh, do, you, do you have a certain brand you like or a certain maker you like? Just Cubans. If it's Cuban, I smoke it. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm seeing little comments here. So people yeah. are here like, yo, dude, it's okay. You just say Cohiba. If you would have just said Cohiba or something, I would have been with it. But oh no, Cubans, 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 Cubans. So and that's and my biggest pet peeve, man. We're not here to be bougie about it. We're not here to be, uh, you know, stick our noses up at people. We want to have fun and enjoy. So just, just be that person, you know, be relaxed and enjoy it. Ask questions and don't be intimidated. Okay, so uh, we're going to wrap up any last thoughts and then we're going to go to Q&A, bring Jared on. And then we have David Powell from uh, from Hutch, H Hudson Whiskey, who we're going to bring Love on David. about whiskeys. And he's a big uh, cigar smoker himself. So we want to go into that. So any David, last thoughts? Do, no, this, no. Uh, my last thoughts are this. Uh, guys, be safe out there during this. Um, you know, really practice social distancing. Put your masks on. Be safe. Um, it's just what we're in is something so unique that's never happened in U.S. history. And just just be smart. And the more we do our part as civilians, um, the faster we can get back to normal, faster we can get back out there, get back to work, get back to our routines and uh, just be safe. Absolutely. OK, so here's a question I'm going to put out uh, from uh, Stefan LaRoche. Yes. OK. What uh, pair? Let's see. It's subtle, pretty smooth. Excuse my lack of description. I'm not well versed. You're a gentleman, and we appreciate the question. Um, so smooth and fruity. Uh, one cigar off the top of my head would be the Romeo by Romeo. Uh, I'm gonna only suggest cigars off my menu, so that way I can be a little more well versed because uh, my cigars on menu I'm very very educated on. Um, the Padron 90 as well. What you want to do when you have smooth and fruit. There's a note in cigars that not many people recognize. It's a dark fruit note. So it's like a wet raisin or a really dried, wet cranberry, and it's very chewy. So when I have that one, I like to do that because matching up that one note like this, and then you have other notes here, that creates a pairing. So mm -hmm. you want to get one or two notes that match up, and then the cocoa and espresso or the, the, the woody over here, they all become one. And that's what I like to do with wines, especially. So I would suggest the Romeo by Romeo or the Padron number 90. These are really well with that wine. All right. So I got another question from Anthony Kalamut. Uh, Let's see. Should we read it? Yeah, go ahead. 
All right, I tried Angel's Envy and had a Nat Sherman Timeless Pan America. Amazing cigar, love Michael Herklotz. Didn't pair well. What would you recommend both ways? Uh, AE with a cigar, Timeless with a whiskey. All right, so I actually had the Timeless Pan America the other day and I did a Macallan 12 with it. So that was really fun and I enjoyed that. Uh, Angel's Envy, I'm not sure if you had the rye or the bourbon. Either way, I'm a big fan of Angel's Envy and what they do. Um, Angel's Envy is one of the easiest ones to pair. I'm going to be honest. I'm really surprised you didn't enjoy that with uh, the Nat Sherman Timeless. As far as the Angel's Envy, I would suggest something really nutty. Uh, the Soho Matador, the one I'm smoking now, has this dried, crushed peanut aftertaste. And it's one that I really enjoy. Another great one would be uh, the Hefe, the one I mentioned before with the Padron, uh, the uh, Nicaraguan tobacco and the Brazilian wrapper. Cause you're gonna want something with some like little oomph to it. Not overwhelming, but you want that oomph. And that goes really well with the Angel's Envy. And it's actually one of the pairings that we have. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna bring uh, Jared Bailey on. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the side, Mike. I'm just gonna put uh, uh, Jared on. He's gonna make a couple cocktails for us right now from home. All right, Michael, we'll bring you back on in a few minutes. Cheers, everyone. Be safe. Jared Bailey, bar manager, Soho Cigar Bar. How you doing, buddy? Doing well. How are you guys? That was a great talk you just had with Mike. Always love uh, hearing what Mike has to say. Repping the uh, repping the cigar bar. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Listed the floor is yours. Show us what you got. Uh, do you want to go over any drinks that you're going to make? I'm going to slide over here, and the floor is all yours, okay? Yeah, I got, um, when we're doing this, the, the goal is to do it two ways. One, we're using um, Hudson whiskey, um, both the, uh, the baby bourbon and the Manhattan rye. We're going to make two different drinks. One is off Soho Cigar Bar's menu. It's called the Kentucky Lemonade. If you want to take a screenshot right now, this is how you make it. Oops. There we go. Uh, yeah, so it's really simple. Um, just think of this one as a mashup between a whiskey sour. Everyone loves that. And mint julep, RIP to the Kentucky Derby. Hopefully we can enjoy it later this year. So to make this, um, we're going to mix it. So we have our shaker right here. We're going to pour in two ounces of the Hudson Baby Bourbon. And we're going to do an ounce of the lemon juice and an ounce of simple syrup. Don't let this freak you out. Um, simple syrup, you just take a saucepan, cup of sugar, cup of water, stir it up, boil it. When it reaches this consistency, it's basically just thick, sugary water at this point. There's your simple syrup. If you don't feel like you're going to use a lot of it, you can just throw a dash of sugar and that'll be the same thing. Um, but if you do the dash of sugar, remember to shake a little extra hard because the sugar is not dissolved. And you're also shaking it cold, so that affects how it breaks down. We have all those. And since I don't have the ginger beer, and the goal of this is to just make it as easy as possible. If you have ginger beer, that's cool. If you have soda water, that's awesome. Ginger ale works as well. What I have at my disposal is a ginger liqueur. So I'm just going to throw in a little bit of that. There we go. I don't want it to be too sweet. We want to get some in there. And I know there's spices. We're going to use around six to eight mint leaves. Just throw them in there. We're going to add our ice. We're going to shake it up. Now, a lot of drinks that are shaken, they're strange, which means uh, everything that's in it except the ice comes out. But since we have the mint and we want all the juicy goodness of that to go in the drink, we're just going to do what we call a tumble, which is when you shake it up and you just pour the drink straight in. I'm going to add another ice cube and garnish it with a lemon wheel. If you have ginger beer, now is the point to add it. But since I use the ginger liqueur, we're good to go. The second drink we're going to do is a variation on the uh, old fashioned. So old fashioned is one of the most beloved drinks of all time. Super easy. It's the base of whiskey, bitters. Also, sometimes orange bitters and a little bit of sugar. You can use really any sugar you want, raw sugar, white sugar, demerara, maple syrup. You can do anything. Um, today, we're going to go back to the simple syrup, and we're also going to use the Hudson Manhattan rye. Um, here is the recipe real quick if you want a screenshot. 
But instead of a normal old fashioned today, we're going to capitalize on a trend that a lot of people um, that was growing in vast popularity before the coronavirus. It's uh, smoked cocktails. Now, with smoked cocktails, normally they have a, a cedar plank or something. They torch it, they get the smoke, and they flip the glass upside down. And then when the drink is ready and they're ready to strain it into the glass, the glass has this nice smoky aroma. In order to make this, again, easy for you guys, we're going to use a smoky whiskey. This is a some special edition Kalila. Um, it's a type of scotch. It's smoky. If you don't normally like it, that's fine. But remember, we're just going for the smoky flavors. So we poured a little in the glass. We're going to swish it around a little bit. This is called giving it a rinse. Nice rinse. Make sure most of the glass is covered. Try not to spill too much. When that's all done, dump it out. R.I.P. All right, I'm going to make this drink. Boom, there we go. We're going to add our ice. I'm working with a couple different things here. Uh, and if you like the fancy molds, if you go to Marshall's, Amazon, anything like that, ice cube molds, super easy to find. You can get clear ice, blocked, circles, spheres, anything you want. It'll be the ice first. The Manhattan rye. I always like rye. Whenever I go to a bar, I put, um, I ask for rye whiskey for my old fashioned because sometimes bartenders will. You never know how much sugar they're going to use or what kind of sugar they're going to use. And I don't really like super sweet drinks. The rye gives it that spiciness, whereas the bourbon just tends to be a little smoother, a little sweeter. So if the bartender does use too much sugar, the rye is always a great balance of that. Um, then, like I said, we're going to add our simple syrup, half ounce of that. Again, if you don't want to make simple syrup, don't know how, Google it. If not, just put like a quarter teaspoon in. Um, aromatic bitters. This is just a great thing to have for a home bar. Um, Angster is probably the most popular one. These are the Bitter Truth. Jack Rudy makes a great one. We're going to do two dashes of this. And then normally for an old-fashioned, this is where I stop and I just stir it up at Soho. Um, but for this one, because we got that smoky going on, I also want to capitalize on some other flavors. Like Mike was talking about the pairings with cigars. We just want to bring all relevant flavors together. Um, these are some bitters I picked up. They're called... Um, Mr. Bitters, they're, the flavor is fig and cinnamon, which will go really well with that salty briny of the rinse that we used. And it's stuck. There we go. And also the earthy tones of the rye and the aromatic bitters. I'm just going to use a couple drops of that. I'm going to stir it real nice. There we go. See that? You can use a regular spoon. This is a bar spoon. You can pick it up anywhere. Um, they're really not that hard to find. Most bar tools you can source from anywhere. Even a lot of grocery stores in New York have them, which is pretty cool. Then you're going to strain it. and add the ice first. Got the rocks glass. We're going to strain this. So we're not going to do a tumble. We don't want that dirty ice. It's called dirty ice. Clean ice. Got that clean ice in there for our old fashioned. I'm going to use a orange peel. And by squeezing the orange peel, you're really expressing a lot of flavors into the drink. Um, grapefruits, the same way, limes, any fruit, any peel that you use, hopefully you can see it. Yeah, there we go. That was beautiful. Um, and it gets all the essential oils out of the orange, and it adds a nice aroma to go along with the smoke and all the other flavors in it. Cheers. That's me, Jimmy. Awesome. So we got a question from Anthony. Uh, this is great. Fantastic. Gary, you did a fantastic job. They look delicious. Like I'm like, I'm over here. This I'm is like, banging. how do I get this one? Banging. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have, a <laughs> you see if this goes on for much longer, I might batch and deliver. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Anthony's asked, would campfire bourbon work for the smoky flavor? Campfire bourbon. Um, it, it would. It wouldn't add as much. Um, so like I said, the, the purpose of rinsing it with the Kalila Lafroy also works, Lagavulin, um, anything like that, anything long, anything that mimics those profiles, those would all work. I think Johnny Double Black might be included in that, but that's also a bunch so it's crafted to be a little sweeter. You really want, like, if you had, like, a cask strength like Kalila or Lafroy, that would be ideal. Um, but like I said, the whole purpose of this is to mimic the trend of uh of the, the smoke which is when people normally have the cedar plank and they take a torch and they 
and they're lit they're lighting the cedar plank on fire and they're putting the glass over it and the whole glass becomes cloudy so campfire would work it just wouldn't provide as much smoke as it were and not as much of that aroma which really blends well with like i said the elements of the rye and the bitters okay awesome uh jerry thank you so much uh it's fantastic uh love the love the drinks it was a great addition to the show i'm gonna bring michael and we're gonna bring david powell on right now uh jerry thank you so much have a great day thank you it'd be good man be safe cheers jimmy cheers guys Stay michael there he is how great David powell, u.s ambassador of hudson whiskey how are you I'm good, man. It looks like I'm going to have to adjust myself slightly because have, uh, I'm going to I have the drink. I don't know if you guys see there it. There we go. David, what's up, buddy? I'm David, good, man. Mike, how are you? So after, after I was tuning into the very beginning and, and I heard your story about the uh, the Cuban Romeo. So I actually adjusted a little bit what I was going to smoke and I ended up just breaking out the little resort. <laughs> there you go. You my know. man. Because the humidor is the humidor, and I don't ever get a chance to to actually light sticks up enough now, minus you know the the social exercise of smoking a cigar with somebody. So this yeah. seemed like the right time to actually pull that one out of the collection. Yeah, good man. I appreciate it. It's uh, it's crazy. You're you're absolutely right. The uh, social aspect of our lives has changed so much. It's funny, man. Like the, the so the first cigar that I smoked since quarantine was instituted, uh, I was watching The Last Dance. The, the Mike docu, the MJ documentary. And I was watching them in the very beginning, like the first scene of the first episode, they just like have this crazy shot where they're coming in from behind him. And he has like a, a real long skinny stick. And I've been sitting on the, uh, the Drew Estate like A's mm. for a couple years without having the proper occasion to actually break them out. Cause I go to the Connecticut barn smoker every year. Nice. And I was like, man, you know what? This is the right time to finally smoke an A. And it was it was awesome. It was beautiful. Yeah, it's you know, I, I'm I, I'm 50 50 on the saving cigars, you know? Like, I hear you. I, I have some like 50 year olds in this thing, and it's like sometimes I'll wait for a wedding or something, and then sometimes it's Tuesday and I want it. So yeah. like <laughs> it's it's hard to like cut them sometimes, you know, but I don't like hoarding cigars. I like to smoke and enjoy, but I, no, I I'm with you, man. I, I don't think that there's any wrong way. The same way that I kind of feel about whiskey and cocktails, like there's no wrong way to actually enjoy it. It's all based on your palate, kind of your taste, the things that you're into. I feel the same way, right? Like I have, um, I picked up uh, like a bottle of Balvenny. Um, they put out this range now called the Balvenny Stories. Yeah. And did one that's like a new American oak barrel. Uh, it's called like sweet toast or something like that. And it's just like, just so amazing. And despite the fact that it's not one of my brands, it, there's like a very specific moment in which I want to taste that. Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. It's I'm, I'm very spoiled having the selection we have. Uh, I will say the Hudson is all I drink in a Manhattan though. That is by far my favorite Manhattan. And uh, the hardest question is, do I do the bourbon or do I do, I do the rye? Yeah, so my favorite question for you, like, what's a better Manhattan in your opinion, the rye or the bourbon? So to me, right, like that takes me back completely into my bartender brain, and my bartender brain only has one answer to that question, and that it's Manhattan rye all the way, right? Because the because the Manhattan is traditionally a rye cocktail, and just because I think that our rye is super unique, like there aren't very many people that are putting ryes on the market that are ninety percent rye. Right. Like it's most people's mash bills are somewhere around like 60, 15, 15, 10 or like, you know, 55, 15, 20, 10. Or there, there are all these different ways that you can play around with your mash bill, which is basically your recipe of grain before you go into your cooking process. So whatever your ratio, the same way that we think about cocktails, right, your ratio of sweet to sour to spirit is going to determine the flavor profile of that particular drink. Your ratio of corn to rye to wheat to barley is going to determine the final flavor profile of your whiskey. And we, we've now gotten to the point where we realize that we're, we're kind of one of the few people that are approaching whiskey making that way. And we kind of coined a new term for it, which is single grain whiskey, because we're focusing on the grain, not on the ratio. Man, it's it's you know I love I love hearing stuff like this and I love hearing stories like this because 
this is one of the reasons I've uh, studied spirits on my own is because the passion in your voice and the education is, it's not much different than the cultivation of premium cigars. You know, there's, it's such a, a laborsome activity and it's, it's, it's so much hard work that goes into it. And you're not, you're not becoming millionaires doing this. You're not making 300 K a year. This is like, yeah. this is people doing these jobs that are so in love with it. It's, it's really breathtaking. And, uh, you know, it's really hard to articulate. Uh, I know you, we've spoke before and I know you've been to distilleries and I know you've been to a bunch of these places where they cultivate the spirits. And I've been to cigar factories in the Caribbean and it's one thing to know about it and study it and work with it. But it's another thing to really see it. Agreed. You know, to see these people like just like turning wrenches and, you know, on their hands and knees planting seeds like it really is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And uh, we're lucky enough to be in this aspect of it because I'd rather be doing this than be on the farm, to be honest. Although I did be on the farm. It's fun, but it's tough, man. I get it. I get it. I, I got to say, I'd, I'd rather be on the farm right now than in my farm. <laughs> I just, as long as we're six feet, six feet away from each other. Yeah. There's a lot so more David, space to play with on the farm, for sure. It's true. <laughs> David, U.S. Ambassador of Hudson Whiskey, right? You work for William Grant. Tell us about, um, number one, before we go into it, tell us about the first cigar you had and what would that experience was like. Man, like, all right. So if I'm going to be completely honest, right, the, the first cigar that I ever experienced, I did not smoke as a cigar. If I'm just going to be completely honest, right? <laughs> like that, that's me as a teenager. That is me three to four life paths ago, right? Um, but my first experience with cigars was my grandfather. And so I, I actually have had the privilege of taking over my grandparents' apartment. Uh, my grandfather passed about a year and a half ago. And this was basically like my second home. So when my parents were at work, my grandparents would pick us up. We'd be here. This is like where we learned how to multiply and we would do our homework before like our parents came to pick us up to go back home. And so like, I, I just remember my grandfather and I still actually have a couple of boxes uh, in the back of like his old like El Producto cigar boxes. And he would keep any manner of like important paperwork or, you know, like just things that he wanted to know where they were. Those always ended up in cigar boxes. And so as I've grown into myself and I feel very much like I'm my grandfather, like two generations removed. Like I, I look more like him than I look like my dad if you were to put pictures of us up at the same age. And so I have all of these cigar boxes from like when cigars became a thing for me that I now keep all manner of important things in as well because it's a tangible way of me connecting to my grandfather. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for me, then I, then I feel like the first important cigar that I had was um, I was consulting. I used to be the head bartender at Red Rooster, which is Marcus Samuelson's restaurant up in Harlem. And he was uh, getting ready to open a restaurant at the Fairmont Resort in Hamilton, Bermuda. And so they asked me to go down and to do the training for the bar, for the bartenders at the resort. And every night at the end of the night, we'd be pulling like 12, 14 hour days easily. But at the end of every night, myself, the executive chef, and then Marcus's business partner would sit out on this beautiful patio in Hamilton, Bermuda, looking out on Hamilton Bay and we would just smoke cigars. And I got to know them better than I ever had known them in the two years prior when I was working for them in New York, because we just had this like 45 minute period of decompression every day where yeah. there, you know, our, our roles were not important. What we were doing in the scheme of, you know, opening the restaurant was not as important as us having this opportunity to decompress with each other. And that's when I started to understand what cigar culture really was. Yeah, very, very beautifully said. And I have to say, like, because uh, I've been in uh, entertainment for over 15 years. If you go to a bar and you turn to somebody and say, hey, what are you drinking? And say, who are you? Who are you asking me, right? But if you go into a cigar bar and you ask, what are you smoking? I'm smoking this. Yeah. Okay. It opens up. The, it's a totally different zone of comfort. And people are open to discuss. It doesn't matter who you are. Everyone wants to get together and have a cigar and talk. 
So tell me about the so Hudson whiskey. Uh, I'm drinking the uh, baby bourbon right now. Good man. Fantastic, fantastic. I'm, I'm enjoying it very much. I got the rye. I'm, I'm so, doing the rye as well myself. Yeah. Oh, you're drinking the rye. I'm doing I'm the drinking. rye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's. Just because I, I didn't want to be a jerk and break out something that you guys weren't going to be able to have as well. You know, it's like. <laughs> Very thoughtful. I appreciate it. <laughs> Very thoughtful, David. I mean, I say. So the guys at the distillery take care of me, you know. <laughs> Perks of the job. Perks of yeah, the job. Exactly. So tell us about well, tell us about you, who you are, and and, and let's talk about the company. Um, man, if if a, if I were to describe myself, I probably would have to say, like, first and foremost, I am a chameleon by nature. You know, I feel like I've traversed through so many different kind of swaths of culture um pretty much up until my junior year of college i i was convinced that i was going to be a professional baseball player um, i was a bat boy for the yankees in 1997 and 98. Derek jeter gave me my clubhouse nickname i played middle infield through college and i played in chuck knoblock's cleats and with his glove because we wore the same size shoes when i was 17. You know, and so then my my university, I, I, so I graduated from Howard. I started off at the University of Michigan. But when I was a freshman and sophomore in college, I was 5'10", 135. Um, and so what's really funny is like when I think about when I, so I made the team as a walk on at Michigan my sophomore year and they listed me at six feet, 165. And I didn't make it to 165 until 2020. <laughs> <laughs> which which to me is hilarious um but so then uh my degree was in advertising i ended up working at some ad agencies for a little while but i realized i was in media planning and i'm far more of a creative by nature uh, media planning is probably the most data analytics heavy swath of the advertising industry that you could possibly work in outside of like strategic planning and so I realized that that wasn't for me. But at the time, I had a friend who was a, a music producer and, you know, entry level salary for a college graduate in 2004 was somewhere around like 32 grand a year. Yeah. Um, and this was at a very, very well respected parent company that had taken their media arm out. But, you know, as a 22 year old, I guess that's what they thought that, you know, all of us were worth because I wasn't the only person making 32. And so my buddy who was a producer ended up getting a placement on 50 Cent's second album. And immediately he was like, look bro, I can pay you whatever you want to. Like what you're making right now is not gonna be very much to me when this 50 back end comes in. Uh, it was the Massacre album, which sold 1.4 million copies in the first week. So I was like, you know what? You're probably right. <laughs> and <laughs> so I immediately put in my two weeks and I started working with him in the studio. That threw me into probably like a 10 year, rabbit hole of the music industry and the way that i got into hospitality is my girlfriend at the time was the former uh music editor for vibe magazine and she was now editor-in-chief of this magazine called honey and they were getting ready to transition from print to digital and for anyone who knows how like media works right it's the same way that when the music industry had a transition from cds to mp3s they resisted it because the business model was built off of physical production and their their efficiency in physical production and their ability to make a record for a dollar that they could then sell for 15. Uh, and the same thing happened with print, right? So if you're producing a magazine that everyone just has the opportunity to log on to a website, you don't need your physical production budget anymore. And so her CEO started embezzling all of the funding because he knew that that pipeline was about to end. And she had bartended her way to New York City after graduating from the School of Journalism at Syracuse and was like, look, um, here's my resume. I've never needed anything from you before. Cut it in half. Put me as your first reference because nobody's going to call more than one person. And you're smart enough to figure it out. And I had two interviews. The first one I bombed because I had no idea what triple sec was. <laughs> and <laughs> it was don't a, be a minute, don't, be, don't be ashamed. It was a two-question two interview. The guy was like, so how do you make a Cosmo? And I was like, well, it's vodka and lime juice and cranberry and something else. He's like, all right, cool. How do you make a margarita? 
and was like, well, it's tequila and lime juice and like this one other thing. I, I can't think of it right now. He's like, cool, we'll get back to you. Never heard from him again. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two two days later, I had a com I, I had a interview at this little cocktail bar in the East Village called Death and Company. And the GM at the time, Frankie Rodriguez, didn't ask me anything about cocktails. He just had a 45 minute conversation with me about me and about the bar. And what I came to find is that Frankie wasn't looking to see how much I knew. He was looking to see if he hired me, would I in any way put the reputation of the bar at stake by being a representative of them? Because he knew that he could train me on everything else that came outside of you not embarrassing the brand. And that's exactly what happened. And I learned my work ethic from them. And to this day, Death & Co is an indelible part of me. And it's kind of guided the way that I've navigated through you know, the last 10 years of my career. Man, that's beautiful. I, I like just to jump in. Death and Co is like one of those bars in New York. Like, like if you know, you know. If you don't know, you don't know. But they're very much like a um, an example of what the industry should be, uh, and that's really, really impressive. And it makes sense because when I got hired at uh, Soho, it was a little bit different because I had a, a very long relationship with the owner, but the reason he trusted me and the reason he hired me and brought me on, even though I haven't never worked at a cigar bar before is because he knew that I could, you know, bring his brand forward the way he wanted it to be brought. Yeah. Uh, and although I worked at, you know, $20 million nightclubs, uh, rooftops, bars, you know, this is very much like one of the smallest spaces I've ever worked. And he just wanted to make sure that I could come in and, you know, recreate what he's done. So I can very much appreciate that interview. And that's the biggest deal because I can teach you what triple sec is in one minute. Yep. Right. But I can't teach you how to like, create, like bring my brand forward the way I want to. And uh, it makes sense that he had the 45 minute conversation. And uh, I can relate to that on many levels, especially with uh, So Cigar Bar. Yeah. So David, so now, so, so how did you get into William Brandt. Let's talk about that. And then, then let's dive into the uh, the brand itself, right? Hudson, Hudson Whiskey. What is that? And what's the story behind that company? So here, so the way that I ended up in, in the position that I'm in is uh, about, I'd say about six years ago, um, Hendrix Gin actually had, they, uh, they initiated a multicultural marketing program. And a, a friend of mine was the New York multicultural ambassador while I was the beverage director at Red Rooster. So he would call on me as, a, as an account to try and you know work through how can we program something at Red Rooster. And I knew what my restrictions were based on the way that Marcus managed his brand and the rest of that kind of corporate structure. So unfortunately, we never really had an opportunity for him and I to collaborate on you know, any sort of programming. But he ended up getting a, a regional job within William Grant proper. So the multicultural program was run by an agency. He ended up getting a Hendrix job within the company. And so then he had to replace himself. So in looking for somebody to replace himself, he reached out to me and a couple of other people that he knew were rooted in the neighborhood. Uh, we also had um, uh, multicultural ambassadors in DC and in Atlanta. One, our, our counterpart in DC uh, is a gentleman named Vance Henderson, who all these years later has now become the national ambassador for Hendrix Gin after starting out his journey with William Grant as the multicultural ambassador for Washington, DC. And so what ended up happening with me is I did about a year and a half of Hendrix associate work on an agency behalf. And because I was trained by their national ambassador and folks that were already on the brand, if they had other events that their ambassadors were going to be out of town for, or they needed coverage for this because the ambassador would be there, they would just hire me to run that event. So I ended up running some of their biggest large scale sampling events in the country, like the Annapolis Boat Show, uh, the Newport, Rhode Island Boat Show, where we're doing, you know, like Annapolis, we do 20,000 samples over the course of three days, which, which is an insane number of samples to give away. Yeah. Um, and so I ended up actually um, becoming head bartender of a bar called the Reigns Law Room here in New York. And uh, my bar director, Megan Dorman, 
had uh, gotten an email from our global, our now global director of advocacy, Charlotte Boise, asking for bartenders from our bar family to take part in a focus group. So I went in the, into the focus group and it was for like innovation products, things that don't exist yet. And the woman who was running the focus group happened to have formerly been the, the senior brand manager on Hendrix when I was the multicultural ambassador for New York. And they were looking to fill a separate role for Florida Kanye rum. And she was like, I don't know why we haven't thought about you. Would you be willing to come in and talk to the Florida Kanye brand manager about, you know, that role and what that opportunity is? And I knew at the time that it was a way for me to get into the company. And I really also knew that as, as it related to suppliers, I didn't want to work for anybody other than William Grant. And that's yeah. not in any way to speak down on any other suppliers and their advocacy programs. But like Charlotte is someone that I look at as such a powerful personality in our industry. And I had only really been exposed to ambassadors within William Grant, but every single one of them, I was just like taken aback by how, how different they were, but how, how they all managed to hit on the same notes when it came to delivering the work. And so I knew that I wanted to be a part of that team. And when I got the opportunity, I jumped on it. Uh, about two years ago, our national ambassador, formerly uh, Han Shan, handed in his resignation and he retired to Lake Como in Italy, where he is now painting massive canvases, which I'm super proud of him for doing. Um, but then I realized, <laughs> and I, I realized that Tuttletown was our only distillery as William Grant and Sons that exists in the US. So I wanted to be on the brand where I could learn about the production process. And that's what me requesting to transition to Hudson ended up putting me in a position to kind of learn. And that's what I've been absorbing for the last two years alongside, you know, Ralph Lorenzo's story and his energy and just the energy of the place and what it means to craft distilling and what it's meant to New York distilling. Because when, when Hudson opened its doors, there hadn't been a drop of whiskey made in New York State for 70 years. That's that's not a small fact. Well, let's talk about that. Why why is that? And and what is the story behind Hudson? Yeah, I wasn't aware of that neither. So yeah, I didn't know that. So like there there like if we think about American whiskey and the reason why it is so automatically associated with Kentucky, right? And and I love the fact that. I've had this weird opportunity to like bridge my mom's career and mine. My mom has been a pharmacist for the last probably 40 years. And so the, the, the reason that Kentucky took over the lexicon of American whiskey is that during prohibition, there were six distilleries that had been granted licenses to produce whiskey for medicinal purposes. So if you were going in for surgery during prohibition and you needed an anesthetic, you could get a prescription for whiskey. If you know, like, it, it was still a thing. Can I get prescriptions for that? Or <laughs> yeah, but now you don't actually have to. You don't. You don't need a pharmacist, right? Hey, Amen. You just need me yeah. or you. But in you know in that way, so like the 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 pharmaceutical industry has always had this really interesting tie to the spirits industry. But of those six distilleries, four of them were in Kentucky, one of them was in Tennessee, and one of them was in Indiana. And if you're an aficionado enough, you could probably imagine which was the distillery in Tennessee and which was the distillery in Indiana, right? Like if you know about sourcing whiskey, you know what distillery in Indiana was allowed to continue to produce. And if you know where the category of Tennessee whiskey generated from, you could make a pretty solid educated guess as to who got that license in Tennessee. But the rest of the country as a distilling industry was forced to shut down because liquor was now illegal. Mm. So what that then did was it affected all of the farmers that were selling all of their grains to these distilleries in all of those regions. So if you're no longer producing corn as a staple crop, then it becomes hard to make bourbon in that state. If you're no longer producing rye, then it becomes hard to make rye whiskey in that state, right? Like New York, Pennsylvania, and Maryland were the epicenters of rye whiskey before prohibition. And we're now just getting back to the point where they've been able to revive those traditions. And we as Hudson stand as kind of one of those first distilleries that put our flag in the ground and said, yes, we, we want to be a part of this. Interesting. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So 
Can I ask you a question based on that? And it's it's really a civilian question because uh, I'm very uneducated on this. Um, the reason that rye was so dominant in New York during the Prohibition era because Canadian prior prior to prior. So are you saying during? Right. I so saying during. But I was curious because the little I know, uh, I know that Canadians made rye, and that was an easy transport down to New York during yep. Prohibition. Does that have any factors on what you were saying? Well, uh, yeah. So I think if, if you think about, if you think about like if these if these places were already palate tuned to rye whiskey, but now rye whiskey they can't buy from their favorite distillery that's just up the road from them anymore. Yeah, they're going to fight a bit more, or they're going to look towards rye as opposed to looking towards something else because that is the that's the swath of american whiskey that they're comfortable with and canada is not very far from us right we we source our barley from canada because new york still hasn't been able to produce enough barley for the level that we're producing at and we only use it as 10 percent of our mash bill but there's just not enough barley yet in new york we're waiting for the breweries in new york to proliferate to a point where there's so much barley that we can source 100 percent of our mash bill from new york but um, I, I think it just makes sense, right? It's like if all of a sudden you couldn't get rum, but somebody was like, you know, privateer is making rum in Boston. You might not be able to get, you know, Florida Kanye or Havana Club or, you know, uh, Diplomatico because we can't import rum anymore. But oh, privateer is up there doing it. I'm, I'm going to start sourcing my rum from Boston. So if I, if I can't source my rum from New York, or if I can't source my rye from New York or Maryland or Pennsylvania, I'm just going to source it from Canada because that's what I'm comfortable with. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. So, so tell me about Hudson uh, whiskey. So, how did they? They're the first in seventy years. You're saying that? Yeah. Or sorry. So, who who is behind that, and what's the story behind it? So there there are two gentlemen that are really like stand at the genesis of Hudson. One of them whose name is fairly well known in the world of whiskey and the other one whose name is a little bit lesser known. So Ralph Lorenzo is the guy who, you know, more often than not gets the rightful credit for being the father of Hudson whiskey, right? Ralph is the guy that brought the property in Gardner back in 2001 with the intention of creating a, a bed and breakfast for rock climbers. We happen to sit about five miles below the Shawanagunk Mountain Preserve, which is one of the most traversed climbing ranges in the U.S. So every you know fall, once the weather starts to cool down a little bit, and every spring before it gets a little bit too hot, you have climbers from around the country and around the world that descend on this one particular portion of New York State. And this property was so perfectly situated. So his whole idea was like, you know, people can come and pitch tents for a week. They go get their climbing in for the day. They come back. They have bonfires. They commune. This would be awesome. And it very much fed into Ralph's background as a professional rock climber for about 20 years. He's the guy that built the rock climbing gym and the Reebok gym, which is now the Equinox uh, near Lincoln Center. And, you know, he just wanted to, to kind of retire from the city and do something really calm and chill and give people a place to stay when they went climbing. And the, the local kind of like, town council wasn't really looking to invite a bunch of tourists into their backyard so they pushed back on him getting the permits for this bnb &B. so much so that two years passed without ralph being able to make a profit off of this 26 acre parcel of land that he had purchased and so two years in he had finally made a friend on the town council and was like hey like so so what can i do because i, I can't afford to just hold on to this and and not make anything off of it anymore and so the person went back and they looked into his deeds into the property and whatnot. And they said, look, your property is zoned for farming. Uh, the Finger Lakes seem to become or seem to be becoming really popular in producing wine. If you wanted to start growing grapes and have a winery, you could do that really easily. And I'm pretty sure everybody on the board would would approve the permits. So Ralph went and started doing the research. But then he realized that making wine kind of required you to be more of an agriculturalist than a winemaker. And he didn't really want to grow grapes. And, right. But in doing that research about wineries in New York State, he found out that there were zero distilleries producing whiskey in New, New York State. And he had this insight that he could be first to market in an industry that just was not 
there at the moment. So, you know, in 2005, when the first bottles of baby bourbon were produced, we were the only distillery producing whiskey in New York. And we were really like the only craft distillery in the state. As of the end of last year, there are now over 180 distilleries in New York state. Wow. And, and New York is second in the country in terms of proliferation of distilleries. And who's number one? The, I, I, I want to ask that question to, to everybody that's tuned in right now, because I'd love to see who we think is number one. Yeah, let's hear it. Wow, let's hear it. Who's number one? Well, hold on. If Jimmy, if you're going to start asking questions, Anthony's been asking this question. Yeah, yeah. I, I, what I, was I, your nickname? What was your nickname from the Yankees? We got to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You so, uh, left that out. We got to know. Let's hear it. So, so my nickname with the Yankees was Tiger because Tiger. apparently when I was 15 years old, I looked as if I was Cavalin Asian. And so, so Derek just started calling me Tiger. And because <laughs> Derek was the captain, then everybody else just called me Tiger. So yeah. there was no point at which after Tiger was introduced to the clubhouse that my name was David anymore. No one called me David. It's Tiger. Like Willie Randolph, who was the third base coach at the time, whose son was my age, used to hit infield to me and his son when his son would be on summer vacation. And even he, when I slept over at his house in New Jersey, would only refer to me as Tiger and not as David. Like he, he is like he didn't know Dave, like he just knew Tiger. But Tiger was cool enough to spend the weekend at his house, which I will take all day. Hey. Listen, as far as nicknames go, nicknames are not uh, picked, they're given. It yeah. could have been worse. They're earned. Right? <laughs> like, they're earned, right? That, Mike the Greek, and I got that for the same reason. You know. But thank God, thank God Joe Exotic was not a thing back in 1990. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I don't even want to get into Tiger King right now. <laughs> Tiger King, hold on. Look at like another hour conversation oh here. My God. Carol yeah. Baskin. I mean, Carol Baskin is just getting blamed for everything. You know what I mean? Listen, you know, if, you want, if you want to feed your husband to a tiger, you, know, That's you, gotta, you gotta soak him in salmon oil or something that the tiger actually wants to eat. Tiger, <laughs> I love it. That's not the worst. But but back to what you were saying about the Last Dance. Um, I've been watching every episode, and that is, I mean. Do we know what the cigar that Michael Jordan smoked? Uh, I was trying to find it. Does anybody know what it is that he smoked during That's his first game? What, what, what do you know, David? Do you know anything? I don't. You know, I'm, I'm really curious. And and I, what, what I do imagine, though, right, is that it's probably – now, okay, I'm thinking through this as we're talking through it, right? So I'm thinking yeah. about it, one, having been in a professional sports organization that went to a championship game, and thinking about how many people in the organization would then have to have cigars passed to them to celebrate winning a world championship, which is a pretty big number, right? It's not just the players, it's players, it's coaches, it's you know management, upper management, ownership. So we're probably talking somewhere in the range of like 250 cigars. You're saying it can't be a boutique cigar company because now, but that's, for the organization this then what what my secondary thought to that is that if mike was already on his path towards becoming the cigar aficionado that he is he would have already preemptively knowing that they had won three games just been bringing the cigar that he wanted to smoke to celebrate to the arena with him yeah. until said game where he got smoked said cigar so I don't know. That's that's a great question, though. I feel like so, so, I think. Go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Well, with that question, I could just add to it. Uh, Michael Jordan's been on Cigar Aficionado twice, uh, and growing up, uh, I was young enough. I don't remember the age, but I remember him being on the cover. He was in a suit, and he would talk about smoking cigars on the way to the Chicago home games. And he would say that he would smoke certain cigars depending on the traffic. And, you know, it's 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 easy with him because even before he was Jordan, he was Jordan, yeah. right? Like there's so many aspects of Michael Jordan to where like, yo, Michael Jordan rookie, 
Michael Jordan, you know, and his shoes kind of define him. Would be like, oh, you know, he was wearing the fours, he was wearing the sevens, whatever it may be. But this is a guy who didn't get into cigars like we did. You know, like I stumbled into a cigar store and was like, oh, you know, I'll buy the prettiest wrapper. Like Mike was given uh, cigars that were so high end, at, yeah. like an amateur level that Mike, you know, I, you know, he never smoked the $2 cigar at yeah. that time. He just got into it. He was smoking. Uh, I see Anthony commenting. So I'll throw you out there, Ant. Um, uh, Cohibas, Partagas, Romeo yeah. Jones. He liked long cigars in the locker room. He liked Robustos on the drive there, even to where Phil was like, all right, you're ready to play. You're ready to play. Like Michael yeah. was thinking like cigars and Phil sitting here as coach. He's like, oh, you're ready to go. Got it. You know, and, uh, you know, I've, I've, you know, Michael Jordan has been such a big part of uh, my life as many people he has. And, you know, just studying on him, he was like, he was so meticulous about all his cigars for each moment. So when you see him after he wins the championship, you'll notice he smokes the long cigars. And then, like he said during interviews, he would smoke shorter cigars because he's in traffic or whatever it may be. But, you know, I know off the top of my head, Partegas, um, Cohiba, and Romeo Juliet were his favorites in the beginning. Uh, I can't speak on him being retired. I know he golfs a lot. I know he yeah. enjoys his life as, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneur, billionaire would. But, uh, yeah, he was really big on Partegas. Uh, Cohiba and Romeo Juliet when he was playing, and then he's uh, he's just uh, evolved so much. He just has the access, and uh, you know it's one of those fun things. But so, as a New Yorker, it was also really painful to watch because you know they they had to revisit Charles Smith under the backboard, missing four layups in a row. Yeah, oh, to talk about how tenacious the Chicago defense was and hard. One of the one of the things that I've told myself, and I don't care how anybody feels about it, but you know, during this particular time where everything is so much weirder than it's normally been, is like, yo, just feel everything. Feel it, right? Feel it, process it, deal with it, but don't avoid the feeling. And I watched that and I started like tearing up because the first sports games that I ever went to were like the Mets because they had just won in 86. I'm born in 81 and the Knicks, and that broke my heart because that was like the year that we were supposed to actually get it, and then all of a sudden- had a solid was, squad, man. Jordan fucked it up, you know, not to curse, sorry. Yeah, yeah. You know, Jordan, Jordan messed everything up, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, you you look at Dominique Wilkins, you look at Ewing, you look at all man. these players from back then. Dominique. Like, if it wasn't for Jordan, there would have been four Jordans, but- Jordan and uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know that. What's interesting is Jordan. Thinking, go ahead. Sorry, Jim. No, I was going to say Jordan is from Chicago. Chicago never won, right? They, they were on the championship team, and they were on the East Coast, and a lot of the West Coast, you know, it was Celtics, uh, Lakers, and then it was Detroit Pistons. And then here comes this Michael Jordan out of Chicago, stirs up everything, and starts winning championships. But the Knicks – I remember watching it, and it was painful, David. I was watching it uh, last Sunday. It hurt. It was like it was it was hurt. It was hurting while I was watching it. But you know what? As you said, we got to deal with it. We got to feel. It. We got to. You got to feel it. Well, let me throw this out there, uh, and Jimmy can vouch for this. Working in the nightlife and working, uh, and Stefan's talking about Vince Carter. You're not wrong, Stefan. But uh, working in the nightlife and. Um, I was very lucky and God rest his soul. I was friends with Anthony Mason and Anthony Mason was like, the Mason. you know, you know. So anyone listening who doesn't know who that is, Anthony Mason was like the bully of the Knicks during the Jordan era. And like, you know, I almost think it's stupid for people to compare people from different genres. of sport. Yeah. Like why are we comparing Babe Ruth to Barry Bonds? Right? Why are we comparing Barry Bonds to Ortiz? Like, I don't like this comparison, and I hate the comparison of Jordan to LeBron. It's a different game. It's a different players. There's different rules. There's more games. There's less games. It's just stupid to compare two of the best that ever did it, in my opinion. That's my but, opinion. Okay. With that said, how do, how do we leave? Mason would say, "Yo, we're playing. 
uh, we're playing Orlando. We're playing Miami. We're playing uh, Seattle. We're playing Michael Jordan. And that was something that I really took to heart because I got lucky. Anthony Mason, uh, before he passed, he was a well-dressed man. And uh, people who are listening know I usually wear suits and ties and all that. And Anthony was a big cigar smoker. So me and him clicked right away when he came to my club one night and we became friends. And Anthony, during a cigar conversation, said to me that, yeah, we would play these, you know, we play Philly, we play Seattle, we play the Lakers, we play this. But it was never we played Chicago, we played Jordan. Yeah. We're playing Michael Jordan this week. You know what I mean? So for that guy to speak that, and I never commented on, I just listened to him and, you know, yeah. we, we, you know, talked. But, for him to say something like that during an era where basketball was at its peak of less regulated, more physical, you know, it's just something special. And uh, you're absolutely right, man. You know, like I'm telling you, if Jordan wasn't around, maybe we're not wearing Air Jordans. Maybe we're wearing Air Ewings or Air uh, Dom Wilkes. Oh, the, the Ewings are the, the Ewings oh, are still out there. You can Air find them. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What happened? You Ewing Athletics is still out there. You can find yeah. them. Now, imagine if Jordan wasn't around. I'm telling you, like, Jordan was the Hulk Hogan. You know what I mean? Like, there's wrestlers from that era. You don't even remember because Hogan was running wild. It's the same thing with Jordan. Jordan kind of came in, filled the void in the market as far as talent and, you know, uh, marketing and all that, which I know you can respect from a marketing background. But, like, you just can't the, – the, the, what he did was so amazing. You know, outside of his amazing talent, you know, and then he goes on to be a billionaire. Like, you know, who, yeah. who becomes a billionaire? What would we have? Jay Z, we have Michael Jordan. Yep. You know what I mean? Like, who comes out of that and becomes a billionaire outside of their sport? It's just really something special, and it makes sense that ESPN did this uh, did this documentary on him, and it makes sense that it's like ten parts. You, you know, know what I love though, and this was something that I didn't know walking into this. Right, was that. Mike fully expected to come back for his fourth year at North Carolina and was like, I love Chapel Hill. And everyone that was talking about him in college was like, he was super comfortable there. But Coach Smith was kind of like, you're going to be like a top five pick. You might want to go. And if it wasn't for that, Mike would have ended up leaving, leaving North Carolina, coming into the NBA with a degree. Right. So it, it where we're right now we're we're so overwhelmed by the NCAA culture, especially as it relates to basketball of one and done, right? Mike came from an era where you couldn't really leave until after your sophomore year, but it just seemed like him on campus at North Carolina was something that he didn't want to give up that quickly. Like he kind of it seemed like he wanted to be there. Well, uh, like again, uh, Michael was a big deal to me, but. It's about that competition and, um, you know, not to get too far into it. Uh, Michael has a golf course in Jupiter called Hobie Sound. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's in Hobie Sound. And it's called The Grove. And Michael Jordan plays 18 rounds. He plays 18 holes twice a day. Wow. And I know in the documentary he talks about, like, Mike's one of the most competitive people in the world. And it was so competitive that he was willing to forego going into the, uh, the NBA because he wanted to stay another year and win a championship. So here's a guy who was like, no, I'm going to say no to six figures and I want to stay in school. Yeah, yeah. And I want to win a championship. Because we could do this again. Mm. He, he was so gun ho about it. And the coach was like, listen, you know, I would love to have you for the year. But, you know, the coach was kind of looking out for him as a financial standpoint. But you know what? It, it also didn't really seem like his parents were all that hurt for money, right? Like we're not like what like what we hear about when you watch like the NFL draft or the oh, NBA wow. draft now. It doesn't seem under any circumstance like they were the sort of a family where it's like, all right, son, save us. Like it did. It never came across that way. No, absolutely not. And you know what? And just to add to that, the little inside information I know, it's because the parents work two jobs. Yeah. The parents worked night and day to make sure that he had sneakers, 
to make sure that he had the, the equipment he needed to make sure that he could succeed. And it's actually a beautiful story from that standpoint. If you look at it from a young age, and I'm very lucky being at So Cigar Bar, which you have both been, and you know the random people that walk in there. Yeah. And um, a good friend of mine works for him directly at the golf course. And I've heard stories and it's just like, his, his dad worked three jobs. You know, he, he did like three different jobs to just make sure the kid had basketball shoes. The, he could afford that. And like the sacrifice does not begin with Michael Jordan. It begins with Mr. Jordan. Yep. And it begins with Mrs. Jordan. And mm -hmm. it's something that like, I think everyone should know. And I'm happy about the documentary because it's not that the kid was six foot five and he could slam dunk. It was this kid was six foot five and could slam dunk and his parents worked 50 jobs so that they could make sure he had the right equipment, to go to the schools he needed to go to. Uh, you know, it was a lot of sacrifice that begins way before the talent. But it's like and this, right? So, and and to, to bring it back to where we even started, right? Like that's like me at Death & Co, right? If I knew walking in on my first day to work a live barback shift that I didn't know anything about anything. But what I did know is that the way that I could offset the fact that I didn't know anything was by outworking whatever was going to be expected of me. So as long as I hustled, as long as I got to what I didn't know as quickly as possible, I would at the very least kind of win over these folks. And it was the same way that he talked about approaching practice. It was like, I didn't, I didn't take off practice. Nah, if, if you can't deal with me and the level of a jerk that I'm going to be in practice and I'm your teammate and I'm when it comes down to the game, I'm actually going to end up being on your side of this trench. If you can't deal with me in practice, then you can't ride with us to get a championship. Sorry. Yeah, it's the same. Yeah, I, you, you said it perfectly. I have nothing to add to that. <laughs> and Anthony, uh, Anthony asked if we think that the Knicks will ever win with the current ownership. No, if they if, <laughs> if, 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 if they drag Charles oh, Anthony out of Madison Square Garden a couple years ago, and then all of a sudden there's a conflict with Spike Lee, who has spent like tens of millions of dollars on courtside seats throughout the last 20 years of the Knicks having the worst statistical record in the NBA over that 20 year span, then no, ownership has no clue. The no. only thing that they have going for them is that they own the world's most famous arena. That's it. So yep. here's the problem, right? MS MSG Entertainment, right, overall is profitable. That's the problem. Between the box seats, between the suites, between the concerts, MSG is hugely profitable. Bro, take, take take the network and sell the team to Spike Lee. I guarantee you if Spike Lee was the owner of the Knicks, we'd be in the playoffs within three years. When I was watching The Last Dance and I Spike Lee doing the commercials with Michael Jordan, and I said, if there's anybody in this world that's a diehard Knicks fan above anybody, it's Spike Lee. That's what, that's what I think. You know what I mean? He I, sat and, and had to endure – the players who were torching the Knicks turn around to him as if they weren't even beating the team, but they were beating Spike. Yeah. Think about Reggie Miller and his. I just don't like Reggie Miller. Reggie I Miller didn't do this to the Knicks bench. Okay. He didn't, he didn't do that to the bench. He did that to Spike. Reggie didn't care about the Knicks team. He was like, Spike, stop talking. If Spike. you wouldn't have opened your mouth, I would not have just dropped 13 points in 3.8 game seconds. But because you, you little Mars Blackman guy, you decided to open your mouth. Now, I just want to show you, right? Like, like Spike ended up bringing the mic out of so many people. <laughs> I would love to be people. Mic up you know Spike. Why? He frustrated people because he was a real fan. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm from Atlantic City. I'm a Philly fan. Now, outside of football, which is oh, man. Schools, basketball was different when I grew up because about every practice. team had three good players. So it's like, how do you create a loyalty here? You know, and then like the Sixers sucked, but then they got better with Iverson. But like, it was just, 
it was just a different era growing up. And, you know, the, the whole thing with the Madison Square Garden, I grew up in a Philly dominated area. But when I grew up, you know, like coming up in the hospitality industry, I'm like, you know, I want to I want to have season tickets to the Knicks. That's how you know. Like yeah, you, made it and you made it. It didn't matter that the Knicks sucked. It no. didn't matter that like they weren't beating Jordan. Like I didn't want to go to Chicago and have tickets, even though Jordan was playing wild. It was always that allure of Madison Square Garden, and Spike Lee was a humongous part of that. It's like yo, Spike Lee and these guys are sitting courtside. Like I need to be here. This is yeah. the this is a monument of success. It's and crazy. That's that even Jordan couldn't accomplish with his stadium. Because I've been to Chicago at minimum 15 times in the last three years, right? I have not once gone to the United Center and just like been like, hey, this is where the statue is. What I will say, the first time that I went to Boston, I walked from my hotel to Fenway. Mm. Yeah. And there's something about that that says, like as a sports fan, right? Now, I, I understand what the United Center was and what Chicago Stadium was and the historical moments that happened there. But there was something to me, and maybe it's because my background as an athlete was so much more baseball than it was basketball. I had to give up basketball when I was in high school because I was like 5'4 my junior year. And I didn't hit a growth spurt until the end of my junior year. So basketball was just not going to be a thing for me. So baseball ended up, I had to make that conscious decision of like, what do I have the more, the, the higher level of potential in? And then let's just dive knee deep into that. And so I don't know if that has something to do with the reason I didn't go to Chicago Stadium, because I haven't seen the Boston Garden either, but I've seen Fenway. Yeah, I'm with you. It's just, it's, it's a hard thing, you know, with the, with the Garden and with Jordan. It's just like a love-hate relationship. Like, I'm sitting here at Madison Square Garden wearing Jordans, watching Jordan play, but I'm rooting this. You talked about Death & Co., right? Yeah. Death & Co. did something really unique in the hospitality industry that regardless if they shut down tomorrow or they're open for 20 years, they're never going to be forgotten, right? And in, that in the book or, like, just in the physical space? Yeah, and it wasn't it, like Jordan did something different in that industry, and that's basically his talent and all that. But it's just something so unique that happened in a dominant industry that's never going to be forgotten. And, you know, uh, you and, know, and I, I think you're right, right? So, so the same ethos, right? Like, what what I'll never forget about being a bar back at Death and Co is like there would be a moment after service was over, right? As we're we're all in the trenches together from the second that the doors open until the second that the doors close. Trenches is a good word. But there's a moment as soon as the door is locked at the end of the night and it's just us allowed for that performance to go that way that night, right? It's yeah. like in baseball where at the end of the game, everybody converges on the pitcher's mound and everyone comes in from the outfield and we all just shake each other's hands like job well done, we won. We would do that same thing, but as a barback, you're not always included in that. So that moment where as a barback, you're like, man, I've, I've been accepted as a part of the team that won the night. Like that meant something to me. And you know what? It's I'm, I'm really happy you said that because when I'm at, I grew up in nightclubs, strip clubs, restaurants, bars, all the nonsense you can imagine in growing up in Atlantic City. And then I'm in New York which is even more crazier. And some of the things I've learned and some of the things I do at Soho is just like, yo, tonight, amazing. Boom. Yep. Down that shit. But like, I do it to everybody. You know, I go to the bartender. Like, one of the cool things about G being a GM is I don't actually have to be in the service aspect of it. Like, I don't have to like worry about every drink and every, uh, you know, every order like the staff has to. And they're a crazy, crazy like amount of detail they put into it and how like attentive they are. But like I can sit back and just watch them and it's just like, yo, tonight you killed it. Boom. Yeah. You know? And it's it's very genuine. And I learned that from the locker room. You know what I mean? Because I, I I didn't grow up in baseball or basketball. I grew up in wrestling and football. But like wrestling, not so much, but football, it was just like you got these linemen that are blocking, yep. right? You got the fullback that's blocking. They're not scoring touchdowns. 
You know what I mean? And even me who play defense, at least I'm getting tackles and sacks. Like they're not getting the recognition. So it's like we're in the locker room and you walk up to people and be like, hey, don't think I didn't see that block where he scored. Yeah. yeah. Bang. You know what I mean? Like uh, acknowledging talent. That's the Marshawn Lynch touchdown celebration, right? It's like, yes, I did this, but I'm shaking your hand and I'm shaking your hand and I'm shaking yep. your hand and I'm shaking your hand because if it wasn't for you 300-pound guys, I would not have been able to dive over the top of your heads. And you know, bring it full circle. Don't think MJ didn't do the same thing. Yo, we won. You smoking a cigar. Were you going to say no to MJ? You're not saying no. Yeah. That's well documented. Yeah, yeah, it's like MJ spoke and we spoke. That's just like sh- that's like stuff I've read, stuff I've seen in interviews where it's like, no, no, you're smoking, I'm smoking, and it was like y- you don't get that vibe with any other product. You know what I mean? Even alcohol. You know what I mean? Which I love so much. Don't get me wrong, but like it's not so much as passing a bottle. It's like if I have a box of cigars and like, yo, we're smoking, we won. You know what I mean? Like yeah, it's yeah. almost on the vibe of spirits to where, yo, we won. Here's a bottle of champagne. Here's a bottle of bourbon. Here's a bottle of rye. No, no. Like it was more of like a camaraderie. And for anyone who didn't understand what that cigar as a celebratory moment meant, Mike was actually kind of bringing them into that. Because yeah. even if they just looked at him as someone that they idolized for his talent and the fact that he had brought them along with him, it's like, well, sh- if Mike is going to smoke a cigar after we just won a championship and I want to be like Mike too, even though I'm his teammate, I'm going to smoke a cigar also. You know, and I'm, I'm going to say this and I'm not going to drop any names. Um, I mean, the hat says it enough. Soho, I'm in New York. So you, you can imagine I meet very unique people I would have never met in Atlantic City. But like I've met people that have played with him. I met people that you know their names. I'm not going to I don't want to blow anyone up. But it's just, they have said it, like, MJ's smoking cigars, we're smoking cigars. Yeah. Simple as that. You know, we're celebrating, MJ had a box of Cubans, we're smoking cigars. Have either of y'all been to a, to John Stark's spot up in Connecticut? No, so actually, I did speak yeah. with uh, the guy who runs uh, John Stark's line of cigars, and I was trying to get him to one of my events. It's in Connecticut. I have not been up there. Have you been up there? I, I had one of the like most interesting experiences there ever. So, <laughs> oh, so yeah. my my aunt and uncle who grew up in this same apartment that I live in, they ended up moving up to New Rochelle when we were kids. And um, one of the guys that my second oldest cousin grew up with is a dude named Brian Shannon. And Brian was uh, Ray Ray Rice's business manager. Really? Around the same time that all of Ray Rice's stuff went crazy, mm-hmm. so it was uh, it was Ray's birthday. Actually, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was my my oldest cousin Kachi's birthday, and he was turning forty. So this had to be about man. This had to be like five years ago, and my cousin Kevin and Kachi both work at CBS Sports. Kevin has now moved on to uh, to working for ESPN. But we knew that we couldn't get Kevin to come and hang out with us unless we went somewhere in Connecticut. So they were like, all right, cool. Well, you know, John Starks has a cigar bar up in Connecticut. Kev, you can make your way here whenever you can because my cousin Kevin now has five kids. <laughs> so, we, you know, we knew he was going to be a, a little bit later than us getting there. But It was during the NFL playoffs. Ray was still at the point where he might have been like a year or two into not having been re-signed. And I'm sitting watching the NFL playoffs with my two older cousins, Ray Rice and my boy Brian Shannon, smoking cigars at Starksy's Cigar Bar in Connecticut. And he also just happened to be there. Wow. Did you talk to him about Duncan on uh, Michael Jordan? No. No, 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 no. We like he 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 more or less like came out as a courtesy, but you gotta remember, right? Like being and and I'm not gonna for one second say that to the outside world, I was in Ray Rice's entourage at that moment, as opposed to like celebrating my cousin's 40th birthday. If you just walked in, 
you saw Ray Rice and the people that he was smoking a cigar with, you'd be like, oh, that's just his entourage. You have no idea it's my cousin's 40th birthday. And because all of us are so close, Ray came out because he wanted to celebrate my cousin's 40th. It wasn't because he wanted to be Ray Rice at John Stark's cigar bar watching TV. You know, and it was it was a very, very warped moment. I, I did want to also like speak to um, to Anthony's comment, like respect for what you contribute is the gasoline to running on full. So when I was a bar back at Death & Co, I knew that I was never going to be asked to make a drink. Right. But what I then found a way to find pride in was like, yo, that daiquiri that you just had, I made that lime juice and I made that simple syrup. I might not Good have deal. shaken it. I might not have poured it, but that fresh lime juice, that's the only thing that makes that daiquiri as awesome as it is in reality, that came from my hands, right? Like that lemon juice in your whiskey sour, I made that. That infusion that allowed for, you know, peppercorn gin, I did that. So I found a way to, to find pride in what little portion of the overall cocktail I was responsible for. And it's the same approach that I kind of take as an ambassador. I, I take pride in the little bit of direction that I get to potentially add to the brand. Awesome. And it's a big deal. It's not something to be like understated. It's uh, it's something you know that we do at Soho to where it's like being educated and be able to share that education. And honestly, what is any education? Think about a lawyer, a doctor, anything. What is an education but a passion? You know, something where it's like, you know, I, I'm not going to lie. There's friends that are watching right now. It's like, who gives a shit about this? I give a shit. You know what I mean? It's a big deal. There's a lot of work that goes into this. This isn't so much the where like, oh, we're having drinks. Like, no, no, this is something where... You know, yeah, we're having drinks, but like, let's have fun with it. Let's be educated. But this this huh? is, let's go ahead. This is exactly what every cigar based conversation is supposed to become. It starts out however you intended it, which was, hey guys, we're just going to share a cigar together. And then by the time you're 40 minutes into it, you're like, how did we get on like the National <laughs> Jet Propulsion Lab? Yeah. And intergalactic tourism and the fact that you have the Lego set for the International Space Station. Have no idea how we got from here to there, but yeah. that's the beauty of the conversations that you have with people. I've gotten to know people so much better by spending 45 minutes with them to an hour and just like learning from them while I have this vehicle for that, right? The same way that alcohol we call a social lubricant, I think that cigars are more like they're almost like a social accelerant because they're not degenerating your apprehensions. If anything, they're making you appreciate the person that's on the other side of the conversation. And if it doesn't go that way, then you know that you don't ever need to have that long of a conversation with that person ever again. That's true. Yeah. And it's, you know, I, when I moved to New York, I, I told Jimmy before you got on, I grew up in Atlantic city and the casinos and, the cool thing about where I grew up is, is that outside of Atlantic City, which has multiple, multiple like little cities, like you got Margate, Longport, you got all Brigantine, you got all these little places that have a hundred bars, a hundred little spots to go to. On top of that, you have 13 casinos that all have a major nightclub, a major bar and a casual bar. You know, they got like a, a high end upscale bar and then they have like an Irish style bar, just go get drinks. And then they have like a marquee style nightclub where you got, you know, it's a thousand, two thousand, three thousand dollars for bottle service, whatever yeah. DJ or blah, 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 whatever they're playing. But it just comes down to that. And uh, it's it's real fun, man. It's real interesting to get to that like astrospect of it all. Awesome. Well, guys, <clears throat> I want to wrap this up here. Any last thoughts before we jump off? I, I gotta say, I had an amazing time uh, hanging out with both of you. Also, Jared, he's been he's been great. Um, any last thoughts before we uh, we jump off here and wrap up? Uh, my only thought is this: um, stay safe, uh, practice your social distancing. Let's get back to 
let's get back to normal as soon as humanly possible. And it really, believe it or not, it kind of relies on us and we got to do the right thing as humans. And as Americans, we don't like being told what to do. You know, I've, I've learned that real quick. Like, I don't like being told I can't go to a restaurant. I don't like being told how to go to work or what to do at work. And, you know, we just got to remember it's for the greater good. And uh, what we're doing is to stop something. And, uh, you know, I think this little interview here is cultivating that. And uh, I'm just happy we can all partake still and still talk about our passions and talk about what we like really love about our jobs. So you guys stay safe and, uh, you know, hopefully soon we're doing this in Soho right next to each other. We can just yeah. have a cigar and talk basketball and sports. Like, yeah. so I'm really happy this happened. And uh, thank you, Jimmy, for orchestrating this whole event. Thank you guys for being on, David. Man, um, if 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 I were to have a, a parting thought, um, the first one is that my my universe has been entirely interrupted over the course of the last couple of days um, over a gentleman named Ahmad Aubrey who was shot in in Georgia and killed while he was out on a run. And the unfortunate thing about who I am and what kind of we go back to and saying like, listen, I'm an ambassador for an American whiskey brand that happens to have locks halfway down my back and I'm 40% covered in tattoos, is that every time that there is somebody oh, that- 40%? That's, <laughs> I I know. Know. Yeah, I know, I'm slacking. Look, this, uh, I, 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 I haven't been it, able yeah. to do any work in, in the last, Two and a half months, but yes, like I mean, 40, we're just forty forty percent for me is solid. Like that just means that my legs are are pretty bare, and I haven't started on my back yet. <laughs> but, but, but but all all that to say, like you know, I I, I just I I hope that we can all find some sort of a way to to sympathize and empathize with what all of us are experiencing right now, right? I understand that there are gonna be some people to which that news story is not gonna affect them as thoroughly as it affects me. But, you know, my job takes me to places that are not very far from where that happened. And what if I was just going out for a jog and then all of a sudden, like that story was about your boy, David Powell, who had just been on live stream a couple of weeks ago who went out for a run and fit the description of somebody who had been accused of a breaking and entering. And so like, I don't, I don't want to go too, too deep. And, but all that to say, I appreciate the fact that, you know, when you asked me to talk about me, the fact that I am a chameleon to that extent has potentially saved my life in multiple instances throughout the course of my life up until right now. And I think that this is a moment for those of us that might have that little bit of chameleon DNA. And I'm not saying just as black people or as black men, but those of us as humans who have chameleon DNA, right? Darwin's theory was not necessarily all that wrong. And if you come out of this thinking that what we're going to walk into as soon as all of this is over is going to be the same thing that we left two and a half months ago. I will challenge you at every step of that. So continue to push yourselves to be better. Continue to push yourselves to grow. Continue to push yourselves to feel every emotion right now because you know what? What solitude allows you is to cry and to not feel like somebody's gonna judge you because of it because no one's gonna see it. Feel it for yourself. Experience this moment for you and figure out who you wanna be on the other side of all of this and then work as much as you can to be that. I agree. I agree 100%. I completely agree. It's very well. And I think, I think right now the world is changing. We, we, uh, and, and not just cigar shops, whiskey brands, uh, cigar companies, everything is changing. Um, we are realizing more and more who we are and what's important to us. So I want to thank you both for coming on. But Jimmy, if, if, if things change and we don't change, then we are at a disadvantage. Correct. Right. We agree. Correct. Correct. I, I'm so thinking about six, eight, 12 months from now that I, I feel like the people that are just being reactive to the moment are the ones that are 
a little bit too short-sighted. And the people that are thinking, okay, and 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 Mike, I mean, I, I can only imagine how much you've had to try and figure this out, right? It's been a lot. The idea of new normal is not meant to be some sort of a concept that's a conspiracy theory. It's that things are not going to go back to exactly the same when this is over. Yeah. And if we don't accept yeah. that and plan and provision for it, then we're just going to be right back here like, God damn it, we're back on shelter in place all over again because none of us figured out how to how to beat this and how to allow for us to be able to go back and interact with each other again and have these experiences like and, 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 and mike you and i need to talk separately about a program that i'm working on because i would love if there's a way for soho to be a part of it i would love for that so let's let's that, find, let's find a way to connect honestly uh you know to the viewers uh david brought that up we already talked about this uh pre-corona and it's something we're working on uh hudson uh bourbon and rye are one of my best sellers on my menu, we have over 150 different types of brown liquors, and Hudson absolutely kills it. Uh, me and David were already talking about doing some fun, interesting new stuff that will, you know, enhance customer experience. And, you know, but Mike, Mike, this particular concept is something that we can do while everybody is stuck at home. So that's why I want to talk to you about it as quickly as possible. So stay this. informed, guys. We're going to get back on this uh, group chat and we're going to talk about that more together as a group and as a community. And I think uh, that's going off what David said. We need to be a community of uh, fine spirits, uh, fine premium cigars. And we can't let go of our passions in this um you know, if you're passionate about working out, get some workouts done at home, uh, get your work done at home, you know, work on work on personal relationships and, uh, you know, just just don't lose sight of who you are during all this. You know, I follow The Rock, I follow Ray Lewis, all these crazy guys who come to our bar and, you know, I'm following them because I, I've become- Ray was there. Ray was there that night, the night that I was there. Yeah, so Ray, Ray, I didn't want to blow him up. Yep. But Ray's a big fan. Uh, the Rock comes by. We get a lot of comedians. Uh, we get a lot of uh, movie people in. And, you know, I follow them on a personal level. And they're all kind of spitting the same knowledge of, like, don't forget who you are. Don't let this, like, uh, this quarantine and this being, like, locked inside your house deter you who you are. Like, look at it as an opportunity to grow yourself and become a chameleon and really just get yourself out there and learn new stuff. And, you know, like, let's all just work together more. You know, I think that's going to be the biggest thing when we come out of this. Uh, we got to work together more as a community and uh, whether whatever your passions are. But we got a long road ahead of us, especially like as Americans, like, and what we're used to and our freedoms of like, you know, we, I think we all take our for granted going and, you know, getting gas and, uh, you know, getting like a sandwich at, uh, you know, whatever, a little corner shop, like even like the littlest things about getting food have become difficult. But, you know, I think the point uh, that everyone's trying to make is that we're going to get through this. And yeah. I think that's the point of this and what Jimmy put together that no matter what, we're all going to be passionate and really excited about what we do. And yeah. uh, I don't think anyone should lose sight of that and be safe out there. So, you know, Jimmy, thank you for this because this is something big that we can all get through together with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think ultimately uh, every industry will figure out how to get through it. But I also think that individually um, we just need to, you know, figure out what's important to us, who we are and how do we get, how do we get to the next level? And David, you mentioned a lot of great things um, a lot of different situations and and I and I applaud you on that and I think that I, I'm I've had a great time just being with both of you just talking and enjoying ourselves as if we're three guys in a cigar bar uh, having whiskey this, this, is, this is the table this is the cool kids table you know yeah this is the cool kids table and and we figured out the world's problems in an hour and you know that's <laughs> <laughs> and that's Anthony, it. yes, that's me. That's uh, that's me. At, at Blasquiat is me. You found, you <laughs> so, found me. And you know yeah. what, David, uh, with his work with Hudson, brings that vibe to the bar. And Jimmy, who's a regular who does work with us, 
we're all creating that vibe of like, just like it is what it is. Like, let's get through it together. And, uh, you know, just not intimidating. Like, let's have fun together. Let's enjoy something together. Let's learn from each other, I think, uh, is the main point of this. Let's really learn from each other and have fun together. Yeah, absolutely. All right, guys. Thank you so much. I, uh, both of you guys have been great. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Enjoy your cigars. Enjoy your whiskey. Um, tune in. We're actually doing a – we're having an event with Gurkha on Tuesday, May 12th. Uh, so we're – I'm going to plug this in here. So we have an event on uh, May 12th with Gurkha. Uh, check – tune in. Michael, you've been awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, last thoughts, anything before you go? You know, uh, you know just to reiterate, be safe. Practice social distancing, enjoy your cigars, uh, coffee, scotch, whatever it is that enjoys it. And just keep in mind that we're going to get through this as a community and we're going to keep doing stuff like this. And I'm thankful for people like Jim who organize stuff like this, who, you know, keep us moving forward and thinking about the future. Awesome. Thank you, Michael. You've been awesome. Dunulis, Michael Dunulis, GM Soho Cigar Bar. Don't, don't get mixed up with the OU and the OU and the names. The, the, the <laughs> Mike the Greek. Mike the Greek. <laughs> Mike the Greek. All right, Michael. Have a great night, man. Be good. Thank, Thank, you, you. Thank you. Be good. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. Uh, tune in Tuesday at rooftopcigar.com. Uh, we'll be with uh, the VP of uh, Gurkha Cigars, and we'll also have a spirit company uh, talking about their brand as well. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye.